Yeah, he said he felt bad because we were running back and forth. So after church, you know, we bumped it all, we moved it all over, set it all up. There he did.
right how you doing? Doing good.
a testimony to his service that you're here. We thank you for coming. We ask that you pray, have a prayer with us right now. Father, thank you again for this time. And God, we ask that you bless in a very special way as we celebrate the life of your servant. And Father, may it be a blessing to all that have come, but may it also, Lord, draw us all closer to you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. It's on the refrain after each course is listed in the front insert of your bulletin. Why should I feel discouraged?
What I discovered was this was his social hour. He loved to talk to everyone there. I mean everyone. Dad loved introducing, showing off his daughters, introducing us to the staff and members of the gym. Dad was a very loyal member at Anytime Fitness, and he was at the gym almost every day, every day of the week. Yes, up into his 90s, actually five to six days a week. He would lift weights, he would use several exercise machines, but he was most diligent with his cardio on the exercise bicycle. Cycling and cycling for miles. <clears throat> I know he was an inspiration to many members in the gym, as well as the gym owners, management, and staff. Something that always stood out about my father was the way he treated others with such kindness. He loved to joke around with people. He was talkative, wanted to learn more about them, and always talking about the Lord. No matter your skin color, occupation, or age, he was friendly, he was kind. In closing, I want to share, <clears throat> Dad prayed for his children and grandchildren every day and every night. At the close of every conversation I had with him, in person or over the phone, he always shared, I love you and I pray for you every day and I pray for Ryan, his grandson. Four days before Dad's passing, my family experienced a traumatic event. Because of God's grace, there were no life-threatening injuries. The hand of God was on our family. I share this today because I truly believe my father's daily prayers protected my family. Now it's my time to take the torch and continue those daily prayers for family. Thank you, Dad, for setting such a good example. I love you. Amen. I'm Donna, and I was the youngest until Renee was born. <laughs> Our father didn't cook, but he sure liked to eat. He had his favorite restaurants, and many people that came through the uh, visitation line this morning would say to me, oh, we used to run into your father at Cracker Barrel. Yep, that was his favorite hangout. And apparently, he was quite the celebrity there. Whenever we would come into town and go eat with him, it was kind of fun to hang back and watch him as he entered that restaurant. He would light up the room with his dazzling smile. He greeted everyone in his path. He befriended those who worked there, and he knew all of them by name. He listened actively to the servers who would oftentimes ask him to pray for them. And he would also hold court with all the patrons sitting at the tables around him. So many times he would call me and say, you're not going to believe it. It happened again. And I'm like, what, Papa? What happened? Well, I ate a Cracker Barrel today, and when I went to the register to pay, I was told it had already been taken care of. And they wouldn't even tell me who did it. A few weeks before his birthday in August, I called him thinking that Greg and I were, would come to town and help him celebrate his birthday. I said, hi, Papa. Do you have any plans for your birthday? Oh, yes. I'm going to Cracker Barrel. You know, my birthday's on Saturday this year, and I've already told him I'm going to be there Saturday morning. You know, they gather around and sing happy birthday to me. They usually have a cupcake or a cookie for me and a card. He was so excited. It had become a tradition for him to be celebrated on his birthday 
by this restaurant. Since his social calendar was so full that week, Greg and I came the following week. A few weeks after my dad's passing, I called, a few days after his passing, I called Cracker Barrel to tell them. I spoke with a couple of different managers over the phone, and they were so gracious and spoke so lovingly of our dad. One of them told me, she says, you know, he was gone for about a week in August. And then he showed up one day and I said to him, where have you been? We've been worried about you. And he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, my daughter was coming to town and she cooks for me when she comes. <clears throat> and what I realized is that even in retirement, our dad needed a platform and a congregation. And he found it at Cracker Barrel, at his gym, and at other establishments in the area. One way that Cracker Barrel honored our father was they put a framed photo of him above a little table where he would sometimes sit by himself in front of the fireplace. I'm reminded of the scripture that says, let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I want my light to shine like my dad's. I miss you, Papa, and your light. Love you forever. Welcome to the celebration of the life of our father, Ken Slider. It is the passing of an era. Dad was born in 1925 and lived most of his 98 years in the 20th century. That was a moment in time when some of the most godly men and women that ever walked this planet were proclaiming the gospel and hearts in, America, hearts in America and around the world were open and receptive. Many times I saw my father approach a business person or a homeless person on the streets of Pensacola, telling them the good news that God loved them and had a plan for their life. And back then, even the homeless knew that God is God, sin is sin, and Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. There was an awakening in America back in, the, in those days, and as America goes, so goes the world. It was a time when churches flourished. America became a bright light to the world, and God began to pour out material blessings upon the people of this nation. There were decades of powerful evangelism, preaching, and growth in the churches. And gradually, as so often happens, humanity became infatuated with the glamour and distractions of the blessings rather than the blessed one in whom we live and move and have our being. The morality compass began to spin out of control with many churches. Money became the God and driving force in people's lives. Churches began to compromise and scandal and perversion was rampant within the clergy. Many churches lost their power and influence in the world. My dad was one, one of the ministers in America who refused to compromise. In all his years of ministry, Dad was free of any scandal or impropriety. One of the great
greatest joys of my father's life was when Pastor Adams asked if he could write a book about dad's life and ministry. It was quite an undertaking as dad was 97 years old at the time and had forgotten many facts and dates. However, that did not deter Pastor Adams from taking on the challenge. In 2023, the small book was published. The title, Dr. Ken Slider, The Steps of a Good Man. I remember the day Dad called me with the news that his book was published and on Amazon. <laughs> oh, he was so excited and so pleased with the book except he was disappointed about one thing. He said to me, well, the editors of the book had cut out a really important part that he had written about Clyde Kelly. Well, then, I said, I, I'm sure they just did not understand how important Clyde Kelly was to your ministry. So today, on behalf of my father, I will pay tribute and tell you about Clyde Kelly. Kelly and his son David are both in glory now, but I would like to introduce his family who are here today. Rachel Kelly, stand up Rachel. These people are part of our family, so, um, and Ginger, such an established and excellent musician, uh, beautiful Rosemary, and the lovely Julianne. We, the Sliders, love you so much and are so honored that you are here today. Thank you. Dad loved telling this story about Rachel Kelly and, and her husband. He always called him Kelly. Now some of you may have heard this story, and I know you will enjoy hearing it again. Dad's first church in Pensacola was Southside Baptist Church, located in the historic district of the city. Kelly and his wife Rachel lived in this area with their three-month-old baby, Ginger. Now, Kelly and Rachel were a striking couple. They looked like they, they were a, a Hollywood couple. Rachel was gorgeous with beautiful blonde hair. And Kelly was a handsome Navy man, very fit, with thick, black, wavy hair. They were not church people. And on this particular Sunday night, Rachel turned to Kelly and said, Let's go to a movie tonight. Kelly said, okay, let's see if we have enough money. Put his hand in his pocket and looked at what he had and said, Rachel, we don't have enough money for a movie. Rachel said, then let's just go for a walk. They were strolling along when Kelly said, Rachel, look, there are lights on that building. Let's walk over and see what's going on. It was a Sunday night in September 1951 when Rachel and Kelly walked into Southside Baptist Church and sat on the back row. My beautiful mother sang the solo that night and dad began preaching. When he came to the invitation, the congregation stood and began singing, Just As I Am. Kelly turned to his wife, Rachel, and said, I'm walking down to the front to get saved. Now, one thing about my dad, he never missed a, a, a sermon or a moment to share the plan of salvation. And so Rachel watched from the back as her husband walked forward and my dad took him by the hand 
opened his Bible and led him through the plan of salvation. Rachel said that while she, wa while she watched, her heart, was, her heart was touched, and she was moved by the Spirit of God, and she too walked all the way to the front of the church and gave her life to God. After Dad talked and prayed with her, he asked if she had any questions. Well, Rachel said, Brother Slider, I don't feel saved. He said, that's good. What do you mean that's good? He replied, it's not about feelings, Rachel. It's about believing and claiming the promises of God. That night, Kelly and Rachel's lives were changed. They would never be the same again. They both began attending church on a regular basis. They became active in the music ministry, in Sunday school, in training union, and Wednesday night service. My dad was discipling them. Now, so uh, Kelly one night was in the choir singing and dad, just, dad was also the minister of music and the pastor. So he had the church choir, he had the youth choir, he had the children's choir, and he was always going off to uh, choir practice for one of those groups. And so on this particular night, I don't know what came over my father, but I think maybe he was just a little bit tired because doing the music where he was playing the trumpet, holding the trumpet with his right hand, and leading the congregation with his left hand, I think I got a little tired, uh, tiring at times. And he did it well. But, uh, so this night he heard Kelly singing. Uh, he heard his voice uh, just kind of rise a little bit above the other men that were uh, in the choir. And Dad thought, wow, he has a, a, a really great voice. So uh, Dad asked, asked Clyde one uh, Wednesday night to come up and lead the singing. And Kelly came up, and you know what, what sealed the deal? He moved his arms. He, he knew how to direct, to direct, although he really didn't know, but he just had a knack for it. Now, Kelly was such a likable man. My father sent him off to uh, uh, so, uh, song ministers of music school, to, where they trained ministers of music. I think it was at East Red Baptist Church at that time. And Kelly took to it like a duck in water. He just, uh, he just excelled. And uh, then he did become my father's minister of music. We all loved Kelly. And, and one thing about him was that, well, he had the courage to take on the youth choir. <clears throat> now, in that youth choir, uh, there was Joe Spann, where are you, Joe? <laughs> Joe Spann, uh-huh, uh, Lawrence Spann, mm -hmm. Frank Spann, there you are, Frank, and, uh, and Julius, Julius Spann. Where is Julius? There he is. Now, I don't know if you guys remember those days. I have a feeling you probably do, but we were a rambunctious group of kids. Well, there were a few like my lovely sister Donna who were um, very, very angelic. <laughs> but most of them were like me and the Span boys. And uh, I don't know how Clyde did. On a Saturday afternoon, we had the youth, uh, the youth rehearsal. And, uh, and I think Ginger played the piano for us some. Um, so, uh, 
and then somehow miraculously on Sunday nights when we would be, when the youth choir would perform, we got it together and we stood there like real like saints and, and did our song with Kelly. Kelly was the most patient man and I will always remember him for that and for his his loyalty to the church and to my father. The story of Rachel and Kelly can be repeated many times over with other people in, uh, that my father led to the Lord. Dad would share the plan of salvation with anyone who would listen. He ministered to people of all ranks. He just had the joy of the Lord. That was my father. Sound the golden trumpet, Dad. Sound the, tr the golden trumpet with Gabriel. We love you. We love you, Dad. Thank you. And thank you, God, for giving me such a wonderful father. Cookies, 
and take our toddler age son with her to visit. George Miller, my dad, couldn't even say her name, but she went anyway. I used to wonder, where did my bride learn to love like that? She learned from her parents, Ken and Louise Sliger. God used them to teach my wife Donna, because they, not because they were perfect parents, but because they were willing to be used by God. It's a recurring theme in the Sliger's life. Ken Sliger was born in Chattanooga, Tennessee. All of the kids, his brothers and sister, were born in the same house. Ken was the youngest and loved teasing and pulling pranks on his older siblings. Evidently, that tendency still continued into later life. Upon graduating high school in 1943, he served 26 months in the U.S. Navy as a bugler, using his musical gifts for ceremonial purposes, such as playing reveille and taps for fallen comrades. Everyone served in those days. And Ken was just 17 years old when he enlisted. When World War II ended, Ken enrolled at Bob Jones University. There he met the love of his life and wife of 67 years, Grace Louise Slider, Grace Louise Smith. Ken discovered that there were two God-given driving forces in his life. He wanted the world to know about Jesus Christ, and he just loved talking to people. When you put those two qualities together, like if you want to make a mathematical equation out of it, on the other side of the equal sign would be preacher, and that's what he became. While attending college, he was asked to become assistant pastor and minister of music at Enderley Park Baptist Church in Charlotte, North Carolina. He paused his formal education for a year and served there before returning to finish school. Next, he was offered the same type of position, assistant pastor and minister of music at Central Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. I once asked him, what were the interviews like back then in the olden days? And uh, he laughed and he told me, He'd never interviewed for a job in his life. <laughs> People would just ask him to come. Or they would tell a church who would then ask him to come. Some doors just opened, and some just closed. That's the way God works. A year later, God led Ken to Pensacola to become pastor of Southside Baptist Church for four years. From there, he located property on 9th Avenue and began his first building program for Granada Baptist, where he served as pastor for 22 years. Next, the Lord led Ken to build again, and Pine Forest Estates Baptist Church, now Northstone Baptist, began on Nine Mile Road. He finally retired in 2006 at the age of 80. I can't imagine working full time at that age, but those driving forces, they never left him. Ken Sliger served Pensacola as a pastor for 55 years. In retirement, Ken was a loyal member of this church, Smyrna Baptist Church, where he often played his trumpet, led singing, taught Sunday school, and probably preached a time or two. Ken Sliger was preceded to heaven by his wife, Grace Louise Sliger, and his son, Kenneth Sliger Jr. He's survived by his daughters, Ann Sliger, Donna Miller, son-in-law Greg, grandson Jay, Jay's wife Simran, great-grandson George and daughter Renee Jones, and grandson Brian Jones. In the last few years, even though his fire still burned brightly, Ken grew more frail physically and began to need help in daily living. His family all lived far away. Many people began to step up and help. There isn't time today to thank all of them, so I'm just gonna focus on two. Pastor Bill Adams and his family took Ken and Louise Sliger into their church when the Sligers had been hurt at another. Pastor Adams simply loved Ken Sliger and helped. As you've already heard, Brother Adams managed to get Ken's life story down on paper despite the challenges of a 97-year-old memory. He helped Ken stay connected to the world and to his family with multiple trips to Walmart and cell phone stores. And he found himself answering difficult questions like, What's my iCloud password? <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Adams. <laughs> you know, it was still hard for Ken to accept everyday help. 
But finally, a person moved to the front of the line and accepted the responsibility. His name is Julius Spann. I bet he never interviewed for a job in his life either. <laughs> Julius put his life on hold and became our answer to the question that many families face. How are we going to care for Papa? Julius was everywhere, taking Ken to church, to lunch, doctor's appointments, making sure he wasn't alone at night, and being the family's eyes and ears. I know this is going to embarrass him, but Julius was our answer to prayer. He was the answer to Ken Slager's prayer. Julius was there to the end. We will always be grateful to him. People often ask older folks like Ken, what's your secret? How have you lived this long and so well? I think the answer was pretty clear. Ken Slager was full of joy. He wasn't always happy, but he was always joyful. He understood why he was here and what his purpose was. He loved God and he loved people. His joy was contagious and people just loved being around him. He rewarded every visit and every phone call. I always felt blessed after I saw or talked to him. Ken Slager passed on to heaven peacefully on October 3rd, 2023. Your life was a blessing. Your memory is a treasure. Amen. But everyone, please stand as we sing when the roll is called up yonder, yonder page four. And hours and hours, I would listen to him, and 
Uh, he could only go back so far. He couldn't remember uh, things. I wanted to get some things when he was younger, but couldn't get them. But got what, what he did in ministry, and that was what was important to him, how God used him. And uh, he had 100 different ideas for the needs. Every time we talked, he had a different idea. Let's call it this. Let's call it that. Let's call it that. But when it came right down to it, I didn't even ask him. I just named it the steps of a good man. When I first started writing the book, I thought it was just sort of a bragging thing of Dr. Slyger. And then as I put everything together and started seeing how God took him from place to place, how he never asked, he never applied. Uh, he just was drawn there. And uh, like, I guess like we've heard, he never made an application for it, but God just called him there. And I know one place, the, the second place that he went to and said he would stay one year. He said, I don't know why I told him that. He said, I would have stayed there longer, but I, when I went there, I told him I'm going to stay one year. And I had to stick to my, my words. And so, amazing thing in that, that sense. When I first came to Spur Baptist Church, my pastor, under whom I was saved, was a member here. And uh, Dr. Roy Chestnut, and he was attending. And, and Dr. Slider became good friends. Uh, and during that transition time, they invited me to breakfast. Uh, with them, along with Ronnie Joyce, who was uh, a member here, and, and uh, we would have breakfast together on a regular basis. And I thank God for those times to this day. Uh, I got a lot of wisdom at that time. Uh, they're all telling me how to do it, you know. And, uh, but, uh, but I took it uh, and, and learned some things. But since those early days, I've grown to know Dr. Schleiger uh, as well as anyone knows him, uh, and became good friends because I, I covered his whole life in that respect. So saying goodbye to someone you love, even for a short time is a difficult thing to do. You know that. I mean, even if you know you're going to see him soon, it's still hard to say goodbye. And uh, Jesus did it best in John chapter 14. He knew he was leaving. He knew those he loved would have a problem with it. And, and he, no doubt, I think, had a problem with it too because he loved them. But he said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. We're not. So I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I go, you know, in the way, you know, and Thomas, it's always got to be a Thomas, said, Lord, we know not whether thou goest, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. One of the last things Dr. Schleiger told me, he said, you know, I want you to preach my, my funeral. I said, I'll probably go before you. And, and, and felt that way. I mean, he could go to the gym and ride five miles every day on that stationary bike. I couldn't go one. So, so I just didn't think that would happen. But, but he said, I want you to preach. And when you do, I want you to preach the gospel. He said, I invited everybody from, from Cracker Barrel and from the gym, and, and so they'll be there, and I want you to preach the gospel. And so I'm going to honor Dr. Sliger's wishes. When Jesus said to his dear friends, let not your heart be troubled, he gave them three reasons why. Why they shouldn't be troubled. Number one, he said he was going to prepare their mansion. In my father's house are many mansions. We're not sorry, but I told you. Now, some people say there's rooms. Well, the Bible says mansions, and I believe Brother Slyger got a mansion. I may not have a mansion, but he got a mansion, and I'm going to visit him in his mansion and maybe stay there for a while. But nevertheless, uh, God said he, he went to prepare a mansion for him. And the Bible says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them to love. I mean, we can't even imagine how wonderful it is for him right now. When uh, we enter heaven's gates, it's going to be one of those breathtaking moments, you know, one of those <gasps> tight moments that amaze us, even though we've dreamed of it all of our lives. The beauty and the splendor will be beyond comprehension. He's there. The second reason why he said, let not your heart be troubled, is he said, he's coming again to receive us unto himself. But that's called the blessed hope. So if you don't have that blessed hope, then you, you, you're, you, you've lost some joy. The Bible calls it the blessed hope. It's a twofold thing. He's not only returning to receive us, he's returning to relieve us. 
And I'm looking for that relief. I, I, I don't know about you, but I'm looking to be relieved. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 says, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. A soldier, a fighter. I think it was um, one of those generals, I'm going to forget their name, that said, old soldiers don't die. They just pass away. They just go on fighting. Dr. Sliger is probably up there witnessing the people in heaven. <laughs> Even though they're all saved already. He had a stellar ministry. He was well, he well deserves his rest. And no doubt he's getting it. But then the third reason, and this is the most important, is he clarified the way. There's only one way that a person is going to get in heaven. Only one way. And that's by the Lord Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty. The penalty's been paid. The price has been paid. Uh, all you have to do is receive it. The problem is some people are too proud to receive it. But by simply receiving that promise that he did, that work that he did, they can have everlasting life. Some people believe you can lose it, but I don't understand how it can be everlasting if you can lose it. It wasn't the right words in the Bible, was it? Or maybe it was, and it's not the right thinking on some people's part. Everlasting life. One way to heaven, one door, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He said it's this simple. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that something? All you got to do is ask. And I always tell folks, the only reason why you have to ask is because he wants you to be saved. He paid the price for you to be saved. What an awful price he had to pay too. But the only reason why he asked you to, to, to ask for it is he's not going to force it on anyone. He wants you to want it. And if you do and you ask, you can have everlasting life. He loved you girls. He talked to you about you all the time. And, uh, and, and just glowed when he did. And so I want you to know, right down to the end, he is loving you. Let's pray. Father, once again, we just thank you for the life and testimony of Dr. Sly. Lord, what an example. Help us to be, I, I know he wasn't perfect. None of us are. There's no one beside you that has been. But he was as close to you as anyone I know. And I want to be like him. I pray that you help me to do so. And I pray for these folks here this, this afternoon, this morning. Lord, if any does not know Jesus as their Savior, give them sense enough to ask right now. And for those that do, Lord, that you can draw us all closer to you, is my prayer. Thank you for this time. Thank you for this man. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.